good morning. Aren't you glad to be here this morning? So we're going to do something different. Today begins our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, I feel the Holy Ghost already. And I knew it was going to be this way. I was trying not to do this, but I feel it. Um, as we begin this, I wanted us to do something different over the next several weeks as we start with prayer and fasting. I, I'm going to ask all that is, that is able that if you would join me around this altar and let's create a sacred moment this morning to where we talk to the Lord and that we entertain heaven because I want to see God move in my life. Does anybody else feel that way? I, I, I want all of heaven to come down, and I want all of heaven to come this morning. If you look in your bulletin, there's a prayer guide there, and uh, over the next, you'll see that over the next 21 days in each bulletin, whether it be an insert or it'll be a prayer guide. The first thing that I felt that we needed to start with this morning is with the glory of God, to ask God to show us His glory over the next 21 days. And I believe He can do that this morning, don't you? I believe that he can talk to us and reveal to us and speak to us. If you are unable to come down and to kneel at the altar and just want to stay at your seat, would you just, if you can kneel, kneel at your seat. If you can't, just find you a posture of prayer and let's just pray together. Can we do that this morning? Can we just pray together? I, I remember the old church used to do this and, and there's nothing wrong with just coming and praying. Amen. There ain't a thing wrong with it. So would you join me around the altar? If you can't come around the altar and just want to just kneel at your seat, kneel at your seat. And it'll be just completely acceptable. Then we'll get into worship and we'll go on with the rest of our service. But let's just join together this morning around this altar today.
morning, North Walhalla Church of God. Good morning. We're honored to have you with us on this rainy Sunday morning. Amen. Is my speaker working good? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, there's several announcements to make this morning, so um, please always double check me with the bulletin. You guys know how I am on reading. So I did want to start out with um, our missions pastors, Tim and Vicki Johnson. They have a a missions trip to Jacksonville coming up. It's gonna be January the 13th through the 16th. There's a group of seven going with them. They just asked that we all be in prayer for them and, and just keep you know the prayer of protection and, and just that the ground will be fertile for souls. They're gonna have a lot of opportunities to witness and for the word to go forth. So we just pray that that word will be powerful and it'll go and do and set what has been accomplished for. They also have a, uh, Tim and Vicki, they're planning a trip to Mexico, and that's going to be February the 18th through the 25th. They cover your, covet your prayers for that as well, and I think there's opportunities. If you'd like to go with Tim on any of these trips, right, Tim, you can come see Tim Johnson. He's standing in the back right here, or Miss Vicki, or somebody from the church will point you to him. But there's a lot of trips. They're going all the time, and they're doing them the most um, economically friendly way you can so they do it the cheapest way they can that's going to be the most effective it's a really good time just on the prayer walks we've seen here in Wahala uh, lives have been changed lives have been given to Jesus just if you talk to these guys they're they're soul winners they care about getting Amen. people into heaven and they also care about doing what the church is supposed to do feeding people and 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 taking care of people you know doing the things that the church is called to do but they do ask that you just Please pray to help prepare the way for them as they go and that the ground will be fertile. They pray for, for a protection and, and guidance and all of that stuff that, that they really need. We also have a newcomers class coming up on January the 22nd. So that's the newcomers. And Mike and Terry Terramano will be leading that in the fellowship hall. So on January the 22nd, Sunday following, as soon as service is over, they'll be over there. Mike and Terry will be leading it. You don't want to miss that. They're excellent teachers and preachers, but uh, especially teaching. You don't want to miss that. We have a baptism service on January the 29th. Anyone that wants to get baptized, please see Pastor Chad or Tracy or call the church office and we'll, we'll arrange that. He's going to make sure you're ready for baptism, but, but we want anyone that wants to get baptized to ask Jesus into your heart to, to make that public display. Um, and then for any assistance, any questions you have at any time on S Sundays, you can always catch Mike Terramano around here. Uh, he's our associate pastor, Mike, and he's always out of the Connection Center. And any questions you have, just reach out to him. We're going to go into worship now. I'm just going to pray and lead us off. But... And then we'll go right back to where we were with Joey and the team. If we'll stand up and just give our worship team a hand. These guys practice all the time. They lead us every Sunday, Wednesday night into the kingdom. And while we're standing, if we'll also give a hand to all our, all our children's church teachers that are over there doing what they've been called to do, our nursery workers. There's a lot of people that work to keep this place going constantly. And they give it everything they have every Sunday morning, every Wednesday. So we really appreciate that. And that just means the world and it keeps the next generation going. Father, we love you, Lord. We lift your name, God, and exalt you, King of glory. There's nobody like you, Jesus. We come and ask you just to have your way, Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for what you're going to do, Father. I pray for souls even now, God, that need to make that decision to come to you, Jesus. I pray that these altars will be fertile ground, Lord. I thank you for the prayer that went forth, Lord. I thank you for the revival that's coming, God. I pray that you'll give Pastor Chad the tongue of the learned this morning. I pray that he'll speak your word with boldness, God. Humility, Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do, God. I thank you for lives that are going to be saved even this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
begin to thank him for the blood this morning. Can you do that right now with me? Would you just join with me and just thank him for the blood this morning? If you know that blood has radically changed you and touched you and helped you and strengthened you, can we just do that right now and just thank him for the blood this morning? Thank you, Jesus. presence of the Lord in this place this morning. Isn't it good? Amen. Isn't it good? Amen. 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 Grab your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12 is where we're going to look at. I, I gave them all the, the Acts 12, but I'm only going to start at verse 5 and go through um, 17 is where I'm going to go, Tiffany. Acts 12. In verse number five, if you got it in front of you, you're saved. If you got to read on the screen, we'll pray for you later. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. Some of y'all say, I read on the screen because I got the word in my heart. I'm good to go, brother. Amen. Good. I'm glad you're there. Hallelujah. Acts 12 and verse five. Acts 12 and verse five says this. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer. I want you to notice that constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Notice who is doing the praying. It is the church offering constant prayer. It is the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. For some reason, I believe that we are entering a season of suddenlies and acceleration. I do believe that. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that to spawn an amen on the inside of you. I say that because that is all I have heard since Christmas, is the Lord keeps saying acceleration and suddenly. But he said, get up, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. My Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. That means he thought he was having a dream. He didn't know it was real. He thought he just fell asleep and was having a dream and that nothing was happening. Nothing was really going on. I love it when God does something that good, don't you? That you look around and say, man, I must be dreaming. And no, it's just what you fasted and prayed over. Mm. Verse 10. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. But I love what this says. Which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are crazy is what they're essentially telling her. 
Ain't it funny when we pray for something and then see the answer that we really can't believe that we're seeing what we know that we've been praying over? And that's basically what they told her. You are crazy. He's not there. We've just started praying about this. And so they said, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. And they turned around and said, it's not him. It's his angel that's standing there. They even got spiritual about their unbelief. But in verse 16, now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Let's pray together right now. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for what you're about to do in this place. Thank you, Lord, that there are some things that have been prayed over, God, in the beginning of this service that suddenly they're going to find answers to. Lord, I thank you that you've brought us to this sacred season of fasting and prayer. God, I thank you that in this time that you're going to talk, that you're going to minister, that you're going to heal, that you're going to move, that you're going to save, that you're going to do things suddenly and with quickness. And Lord, I pray right now that in the name of Jesus, that our ears would be attentive to you, that our hearts would be receptive to every answer that you pour down on us, that God, that we would receive your wisdom, that we would hear and that we would, Lord, expect an answer from heaven. Now, Lord, we receive your anointing today, your anointing, God, that causes our hearts to be good ground. Your anointing that causes our ears to be open and our mind to be attentive. Lord, I receive your anointing that turns this preacher into your prophet that I may speak what thus says the word of the Lord unto this place. And God, we thank you for what you're going to do today. In Christ's holy name, we ask and we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen and amen. If you don't think prayer works, All you got to do is look on the back pew at Brother Jerry Campbell, prayer works. If you don't think prayer works, all you got to do is look around this room. And there are people all around this room that will tell you that the only reason that they are right here is because somebody prayed over them. Somebody fasted over them. And somebody called on the Lord. Prayer works. Now we as a church starting today have entered into a moment of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And you might say, well, pastor, I don't understand fasting. Well, good. I'm glad you don't. We like people that don't know what to do when fasting. Why? Because that means they don't have no preconceived religious ideas and try and make it religious instead of what it needs to be, and that is going deeper with the Lord. That is him calling you into his side. That that is you pushing back the plate. That is you turning the TV off or doing whatever you got to do to get into a moment where you say, Lord, you are the most important thing in my life right now. And I'm going to get along with you and I'm going to fast when I should be eating or I should be doing something else. I'm going to get along with you and I'm going to spend time with you because there's some things I need to get straight in my life. You want to quit smoking? Get to fasting. Hello? Oh, pastor, you done hit us right there. All right, let's go a little further with that then. You want to get some things broke out of your life? You want to get some chains broke off your mind? You want to get some things broke off your spirit? Then get to fasting. And I promise you, if you'll set aside that time with the Lord and you'll push back the plate or you'll do what you got to do, you will find that God will start setting you free. Because what fasting does, it gets king flesh out of the way and it says, I ain't going to live by my flesh, but I'm going to live by the spirit. And I'm going to get close to him and allow him to pour into my life and do what he wants to do for me. Amen? Because I want him in my life, don't you? And that's why we dedicate this time to the Lord. And we dedicate this time in prayer. Prayer is something that 
that the Lord really had to work with me on when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I, I was good for about two, three minutes. And then my ADD kicked in and I started chasing squirrels and I started chasing everything and everything else. But when you begin to, to look at the New Testament and you begin to look what Jesus has to say, one of the things he talks a lot about is prayer. But he didn't just talk about it, he demonstrated it. And he would demonstrate of getting alone and going by himself out into the wilderness or going by himself and telling the disciples to go on. And then he would go by himself and would find himself a place and he would pray. And he would encourage the disciples to pray. And he would find them and, and find moments of where he would talk about prayer. And then he would say things like, about secret places and start talking to them about the secret place of prayer. And he would say things like, if you get with God privately, then God will get with you in the public arena and God will bless you in the public arena because you've been with him in the secret place. Listen, let me tell you something. God is the worst secret keeper that you could ever get a hold of. You want to know why? Because when you get with him in the secret place, he starts blessing you in the public arena and starts displaying and demonstrating in the public what's been going on in the private time. Amen. That's why we've got to get along with him in prayer. It is by prayer where, where things begin to change. And prayer is the most essential thing and the most vital thing to a Christian life that you and I have. Amen. When folks come to me and start talking with me about, Pastor, I, I've got so many struggles and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I just can't seem to break it. The first question I'll ask them is, how is your prayer life? And if they look at me and they say, well, you know, it's really non-existent, it's not there, I can look back at them and say, that's why you're struggling. Because it's hard, it's hard for things to contend in my life when I've got a disciplined moment of where I get along with God and I communicate with God. We're going somewhere. Y'all know I'm laying the foundation, so y'all hold on, hold on, hold on. It's hard for me to expect anything from God if I don't have any communication with God. It'd be hard for me to expect anything and to have a good marriage if I never once said anything to Tracy. <laughs> I can promise you my marriage will probably be non-existent if there was no communication there. And she'll go ahead and tell you, and I'm waiting on her to give a good amen and to stand up and shout and huck and buck because she will tell you I'm probably not the best communicator that ever walked the face of this planet either. And you might say, but you're a preacher. How is that so? Because my ADD gets the best of me and I, I assume that everybody already knows and so I just don't communicate. And then I tell them, oh yeah, we got to go do this. And she'll look back at me, well, you didn't tell me that. Well, yeah, I did because in my mind, I done played the scenario out how I told her and I thought I'd already told her when I hadn't already told her. But if you don't communicate with your spouse and there is no communication there and you don't talk to them and you don't communicate with them, then I promise you, your marriage will not be a great marriage. Amen, men. Go ahead and say it. Amen. Because I promise you that the wife that you're married to, she's going to get her 20-something thousand words in that day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So you got to fight to get it in, but you got to communicate. Amen. It is the same way in the spirit. If I do not communicate with God, I can expect to know the secrets of heaven. If I do not talk with God and I do not have that disciplined moment of prayer, then I can expect God to move in my life because I'm creating a culture of unexpectation in me. Oh my God, that was good and that was from the Holy Ghost right there. When you create that culture of not expecting anything, then what happens is you come to church, you don't expect God to move at church, you go home, 
storm, you don't expect God to move in your life. Things happen and you say, well, that's just the way it is. Because you've created a culture of where you don't expect nothing. But buddy, when I get in prayer with God, hallelujah, he increases as Peter calls it, your most holy faith. And when you get in prayer with God, you wake up and say, "Woo, I'm expecting God to do something today. And when you get in prayer with God and that child gets worse, you say, oh, I woke up expecting, knowing that God's going to move on their behalf. When you get in prayer with God and you get a bill that you didn't expect, you say, oh, I done prayed over it. I know God's going to show up and God's going to meet my need because I've already talked to God and I've already been to the place of prayer. It is prayer that is the seed that gets you ready for a future event that you've never been in because your Father in heaven has already been there and he's already poured into you everything that was necessary before you ever got there because you've been in prayer. It is prayer. It is prayer. In Scripture, we see numerous examples of prayer happening on the earth and things the unexpected that would miraculously happen all because people prayed. Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. Elisha prayed and rain stopped. Amen. Jesus prayed in the garden and it was there in the garden where he was able to pray and bring himself into subjection to the Father and where he would say, Lord, if this cup will not pass, then let your will be done and not my own. It was there in the place of prayer. It was in the place of prayer where the 120 were gathered in the upper room, praying and doing what they knew. And it was the Holy Spirit that would invade that place. All because somebody prayed. I wonder this morning, what things are being neglected in our lives? What answers ain't happening? What needs do we have that we've not brought before the Lord that is not being met? All because we neglect the place of prayer. But oh, what glory would happen if we would get on our face before the Lord and we would say, God, here we are. I've come to talk to you. Nothing's going to distract me because I need you. You've got the church in Acts 12. They are being persecuted. They are finding themselves at the mercy of Herod. James, the brother of Jesus, has now been killed. Peter has found himself in prison. And the church has found themselves without the leader. They have found themselves now with the leader being absent because Peter is in jail. They have found themselves now being a, a startup group, so to speak. They have found themselves empowered by the Holy Spirit. They have seen miracles happen. They saw 3,000 people get saved all in one swoop. They have watched as the man that laid at the beautiful gate get up and start walking. And Peter stand up and start preaching in the temple. And then more people be added to the church. They have watched it happen. They have consistently seen the glory of God. But yet the devil has lashed out at them through Herod. And because the devil is lashed out, they think, well, I guess something is going to happen to us. It, it may not be real, and they don't know. And so for fear, they get together in a house, and they say, we've got to pray. We've got to call on God. And they begin to pray. And the Bible says, as Peter is locked up between squads of Roman soldiers in order to make sure he is known as a high-priority prisoner. They knew that something would happen. Don't you love it when the enemy knows and he puts all the attacks against you because he's so afraid of what is inside of you because he knows if you come to the place of prayer that something miraculous is going to happen in your life. The enemy knew that Peter was a high-priority prisoner. 
And because he was a high priority prisoner, they put squads of soldiers around him. He was so important, they locked him down with chains to the floor. He was so important, they put a guard on each side of him. He was so important that not only were those guards enough, but they put two guards on the outside of the door. He was so important, they had guards everywhere just to guard one man that had never done anything to any of them except cut off a man's ear one time in anger only to watch God heal it. He was that kind of man. He was the only one that had stood up in boldness on the day of Pentecost and preached. He was the only one that walked into the temple at the beautiful gate where the lame man had been there about near all his life and he looked at him and said silver and gold have I none but such as I have I give unto you rise and walk in the name of Jesus he was that same Peter it was that same Peter that had watched and preached in Cornelius' house and then it was that same Peter that while he was preaching that those Gentiles began to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and the Bible said that they spoke with tongues and prophesied. It was that same Peter that is now locked up in jail. And the church says he's a high priority. We can't get to him. There's no breaking him out. So we're going to do what, what only we know how to do. And that is we're going to get into the prayer place because where we can't touch, we know he can. I don't know what person around you is locked up. But let me tell you something. You may not be able to get to them but I know who can and I know he can move right in the middle of their situation and arrest them right where they are and deliver them and set them free hallelujah hallelujah boy I feel the Lord this morning I feel the Lord so here they are entered a prayer meeting they're hoping they're believing they're somewhat expecting, and I say somewhat because we see how surprised they are when God moves. And so, they're praying, and they're praying because they got some problems. Which brings me to my first point, and that is problems. Who in this room has no problems? <laughs> raise your hand. If you ain't got any problems, raise your hand. Astonishing, isn't it? Everybody in this room has got some kind of problem. Right? Everybody. Because nobody raised their hand. Let me just, no, I'm just kidding. I'll keep mine down too. I'm a pastor. Y'all know I got problems. I'm crazy. I got a lot of problems. And most of my problems occurs right here between my ears. Problems hit everybody. And the church has a lot of problems. The first things that we see from them are the attacks. James, the brother of John, one of the Lord's inner circle, is put to death by Herod. Peter now is in prison and is sitting on death row because the Bible tells us that the next day he was going to be just like Jesus was and brought before the crowd by Herod and they were about to assassinate him. They were going to kill him. They were going to get rid of him because they thought if they could kill him, it would shut the church down. And here is Peter. The Jews are pressing these attacks against the early church because they hate the gospel. They want rid of it. They think if they can kill them, it'll kill the gospel. But let me tell you something. China keeps trying to do that, and it still doesn't stop it. People keep multiplying. Why? Because the gospel is not contingent on who is carrying it. It's got to do with God. And if God's in control, then God's going to bless wherever the gospel goes. And so here they were. They were hating the gospel. Herod is persecuting the early church because it gives him a political advantage. Politically, the Jews and the Romans were against the church. It's never changed, has it? I'll leave that alone right there. Mm, God help us. It ain't changed because politically, we still have a group of people that want to come against God's church every chance they can get. 
And then we've got another group of people that politically want to use because they think it is advantageous to them to align themselves with us and try to be among us without ever being transformed by the gospel. But let me tell you something. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It'll transform you. If you get close to the fire, you will get burned. But let me tell you something. I want to be a church that's so prayed up that I don't care who politically aligns themselves with us that what's on the inside of us will jump out onto them and instead of them attacking us it'll attack them and it'll start wooing them in where they are transformed by the power of a holy God so you see the attacks then you see the apprehension that is here the church did not know that what the future is holding for them and as a result there was fear and concern for the future of the church they, these people had left their Jewish roots only to follow Christ and to follow in the way of Jesus they may have been afraid of the hatred of the Jews and the king might eventually turn away from the leaders of the church and settle then on the members of the church they were okay with the leaders but all of a sudden when it becomes into their backyard then they probably were, were cowering down in fear during this particular season that we've been in over the last almost three years it seems that fear has ruled the day amen amen when we were transitioning through an election, a presidential election, all I kept hearing is, if that other gets in, the church better be ready. We're going to find persecution. If this one gets in, we'll be okay. We'll thrive. Let me tell you something. I've read the Bible cover to cover. I've never found a moment where God's church never went under any persecution and found themselves always at the top and always found themselves never going against the world. Because I can promise you, if you're in God's church and you are saved by the gospel, you will always be anti-world and the world won't ever like you. They won't ever want to be a part of you. They won't ever let you go to the forefront. Why? Because you represent Jesus. And Jesus ain't what they want. Amen. Amen. And so, it seems like that, that fear has ruled our day. We've got so many things like COVID. and We've got so many things like inflation. We've got so many things like, well, we're not going to make it. And with the fears of our family splitting up. And all of these frustrations on our job. And all of this stress that we've got and it seems like the issues of our day are numerous and they are exponential and they are greater than we've ever been but let me remind you of this John tells us in 1 John he tells us greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world let me tell you something I tell fear it is a liar it don't belong in the child of God you and I operate by faith we don't operate by what Fox News says. We don't operate by CNN. We don't operate by MSNBC. We don't operate by the stock market. You want to know why? I'm in God's kingdom and in God's kingdom it operates in God's economy. And let me just go ahead and burst your bubble. God's economy is not about lack. It is all about abundance. And when you get in prayer with God he'll build you up in faith that when all of this mess happens you say well it's all right y'all go right ahead and worry about it but I done talked to God this morning and he told me I was going to be okay when the world was failing because that's what prayer does so you see the attacks you see the apprehension and you also see the adversary we are told that Herod is the one who killed James and arrested Peter we're also told that his action pleased the Jews. So Herod and the Jews were responsible for the persecution, but they were merely the human instruments. The one who organized and empowered this persecution was the devil himself. He hated the church, and he still hates it. He was out to destroy it, 
when it was still in its infancy. And in order to do that, he stirred up forces and set them in array against the people of God. If you think the church still has it easy, you're wrong. Oh, we live in America. In America, we got it easy. Oh, no. All you got to do is turn on the TV and see that the tide is turning against the church. They see us as a bunch of hypocritical people. They see us as being anti whatever they want to do because it's a relative truth, it's humanism. It's whatever I want to do, I'm right. It doesn't matter if it offends you or hurts you, I'm right. I'll always be right. Truth is relevant to my situation. It's beginning to be that way in the church too. Instead of the gospel molding me, we like to mold the gospel to fit us. Amen. And then we wonder why God's not moving. I'll tell you why. Because it ain't that I'm supposed to be the one that makes it fit me. It's that I'm supposed to read the book and let it mold me to fit it. And if I'm going to see his glory, then I've got to allow my life to be transformed. But I can't just transform it in prayer. I'm going to have to transform, be transformed by the word itself. Because it's what separates flesh and spirit. It's what cuts away at things in my life and helps me to live the way I'm supposed to live. It's the word of God. So you see, they find themselves with problems. But not only do they find themselves with problems, but they found themselves with prayer. The first thing we see is we see them finding themselves in fervent prayer. There is a tiny word in verse 5 that makes a big difference. That tiny word is a three-letter word that is known as a conjunction. And it is the word but, B-U-T. The situation looks desperate, but... It looks as though Peter might be put to death, but it looks as though the fledgling church may not survive, but, hallelujah, it looks like in the face of overwhelming problems that the church had bowed its head as one person and and they had said, no, we can't do this, oh no, but. It says this in verse 5 that the church got together and they began to pray constantly. You don't want to know why they prayed? They said, we can't make it on our own. We can't do anything without communicating to God first. And they began to pray. They didn't cower in fear before everybody who threatened them. The church lifted up its collective voice and began to call on the one that was in charge of it all. The church began to pray. God heard their prayers and God moved in mighty power in a Roman in prison and he set Peter free. I love what it says about them. It says that they did not cease to stop praying. The word ceasing means to stretch forth. It is a medical term that refers to a stretched ligament or a pulled muscle. It has the idea of going beyond all of the boundaries. When applied to prayer, it is a picture of fervency. It is the picture of people pouring out their hearts in prayer before the Lord as they seek his face for their needs. That's the kind of praying that you and I need to undertake a praying where we are stretched, where we don't stop, where we say, God, I've got to have you move. I can't take another step, Lord, unless you do it. We don't see them just praying fervently, but we see them praying faithfully. By faithful praying, I mean that theirs was a prayer of faith. Their prayers were made only to one, and it was to God. It seems obvious, doesn't it? But it seems like that we design our prayers to be heard by others or just by us. But they joined their voices. 
They reached up as one to touch God for their church and for Peter. Because when we pray, we must pray in faith. Faith is the essential ingredient that marks the difference between answered and unanswered prayer. The Bible makes these statements about the role of faith and prayer. And it says things like this in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not those that come into church and give a half-hearted hallelujah and That's the only time they talk to God and they'll come back next Sunday and they'll say, well, praise God. And then they won't talk to him another week. No, it's them that are consistently getting along with God who are diligently seeking him and after him. Why? Because it is a demonstration of faith. It's not just a demonstration that I'll show up. It's a demonstration of God, I'm going to believe you. And I'm not just going to believe you and say it with my lips, but I'm going to say it with my feet. I'm going to say it with my knees. I'm going to say it with my hands. I'm going to say it with my mouth of when I bow my head in prayer and I say, Lord, here I am again because I'm after your presence and your presence alone. Fervent and faithful praying. Fervent and faithful praying. Their prayer was a focused prayer. Prayer was made simply for Peter. He was the focus of this prayer meeting. They came together to pray for a specific purpose. It wasn't just generalized big blanket of prayer. No, it was praying. It was pointed in a direction. And they believed that God, when we pray, you're going to move. They believed it. So we see the problems. We see the prayer. And last but certainly not least, we see the power. We see the powerful salvation that happened. When the church prayed, God heard them. He answered their prayers. Peter was delivered from prison through a tremendous, miraculous intervention. God saved Peter. Because the church asked them to. I wonder what would happen if we really got together in unity in prayer and that we began to ask God collectively in prayer to do something. I wonder what would happen. I grew up old-timey church. I grew up in a time period where everything was a sin, but I also grew up in a time period where them people knew how to pray. Why? Because they knew that they didn't want to do anything to offend the heart of God. Now, some of their ideas was a little off kilter, but generally speaking, their heart was to please God. And I grew up under that old-time holiness. And, man, I love it. I I ain't going to lie to you now. I... Sometimes I feel like we've gone too far the other way and we need to go back a little bit to there. That's just kind of what I feel sometimes. And I know some people don't feel that way and that's all right, but sometimes I feel like we've just gone too far. But one thing I can't forget is when them saints of God used to walk into church, a lot of them didn't walk in wanting to see who can see them and whose hand they could shake before they got there. A lot of the times they showed up 30 minutes before service because they walked right down to the altar and before they talked to anybody else, they wanted to talk to God first. And I promise you what would happen. They'd get up, they'd go shake hands, church start, and buddy, it was on like Donkey Kong the moment they hit the first note. You want to know why? Because they had done being in his presence. And they had said, I want to get back there. Because they knew that there was a moment that might happen in that service where God might save one of their family members 
or they knew in that moment was going to come in that service that somebody might walk up to the altar and lay an addiction on the altar and get absolutely free of it. I can remember in church, go ahead, Joey, and start playing. Um, start playing, uh, I just want to speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. If you'll start playing that. I don't know, I know I don't normally tell you what to play, but I just feel that for a minute. They knew there was going to come a moment of where somebody was going to be set free and they wanted their heart prepared for when that moment happened. I can remember, I can remember as a little boy, five and six years old, I can remember people walking up and laying beer bottles that they had out in their car on the altar. And then all of a sudden, God miraculously changing them and them dancing all over that church in the Holy Ghost. I remember them days. I remember people walking up laying drugs on the altar that they had had out in the car. Some of them pulled it out of the pockets and laid it out. I can remember people walking in and they'd lay their pistol on the altar because they had determined that when they left church that night, they was going to blow their brains out. I remember things like that happened. But then I wonder, and I feel about like Elisha most days when I'm in prayer sometimes. Where Elijah passed the mantle to him and he got to the river. And he slapped the mantle on the river. And you know what he said? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? I feel that way sometimes. Because in prayer sometimes I find myself saying, Where is the God of Reverend W.O. Reed? Where is the God of Daryl Smith? You want to know why I pray those prayers? Because I want my kids marked by the things that mark me. But I know how to get there. And the way ain't easy. Because it starts in the birthing room. In the place of pain. Because what I didn't tell you that I found a lot of times at the place of prayer is a surgery place. Because I can promise you when I get lost in prayer and I can find myself there, a lot of times God has to do surgery on my heart. Anybody else find that to be true with you too? <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, again where we quit trying to be microwave Christians but we'll be people that'll spend our time with you and communicate with you and get on our face before you and we honor you Jesus for what you're going to do and we bless you and we give you praise for I 
I've got some needs in my life that I'm fasting over and that I'm asking of the Lord right now. I've just got some things that are going on that I'm fasting and I'm purposing in my heart that I need God to move on this situation. Would you just stand right where you are right now and say, Pastor, that's me. I've got some stuff I'm fasting over. I've got some stuff I'm believing God over that I'm praying for specifically. Some needs that I need God to move. I can't do it by myself, but I need God to supernaturally perform a miracle. Would you stand in your feet right now and just say, yep, that's me. I'm there. I'm there. say pastor I'm fasting because I need to get close to him and I've got some things that I need him to break off my life I've got some things I've fought for a long time but I'm believing that in 21 days before I get to the end of 21 days I'm going to watch as God delivers as he sets free as he blesses as he does what only he can do in my life because I'm tired of struggling with it I'm tired of fighting over it and I'm just going to believe him and he's going to break it off in the name of Jesus would you stand to your feet right now and say pastor that's me I believe in God to break some stuff off my life today thank you Holy Spirit Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Who in here would say, Pastor, I've got some people that I believe in God for. They're in a dark place. They are wayward. They are lost. And I know they're lost. But I'm fasting for them. Because they're like Peter. They are locked up. They are in chains. They are in prison. But I'm ready to watch God go where I can't. And I'm going to watch God as he just begins to break it. And he's going to send an angel to them and just say, Arise, get out of here, because I've already set you free. Would you stand to your feet right now and say, Pastor, that's me. i got some people in my life that I believe in God to do a work in. And I believe in God to miraculously set them free today. Thank you, Holy Ghost. 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 Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If you are able, I know we've done gathered around in this altar, but if you are able, would you just come right now? And would you just find yourself a place? And would you just create a secret place between you and God? And just say, God, here I am. I lay it before you. And we're going to believe you, God. We're just going to call out their name. If you need to call their name out, call their name out. If you need to just say, Lord, here I am. If you got it in your pocket and you need to lay it on the altar, lay it on the altar and say, I believe in God that it's going to be broke in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Your name.
streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name, your name is power. Your name is healing. Your Jesus 
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Oh, Jesus for my family, and I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. over every enemy. Oh, Jesus, for my family, and I speak the holy name, Jesus. Yes, your name, your name is power, your name is healing, your name over every enemy. Oh, Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Can we do that together? Lord, we praise you.
you this morning. God, we lift up our voices to you. Knowing that you are great. Knowing that you are God. Knowing that you are awesome, God. We love you, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Oh, we lift up a voice of triumph, God. Knowing that you're going to meet us every day in this fast. Knowing that you're going to do the work, oh Lord. We believe in you, God. We're going to push. We're going to pray. We're going to believe, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. just continues. Amen. It just continues. We're just going to let them keep leading us. If you want to stay around and just worship and just thank God, stay around and just thank God. Whatever you want to do, you just do it. But we're going to believe God that he's going to continue to move. Amen, church. Y'all go ahead. Be blessed today if you think you need to go. Be blessed in Jesus.